The following program is being brought to you on the 7th Wave Network. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit 7thWaveNetwork.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit VoiceAmerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Awakening to Conscious Co-Creation with your host, Peter Tung. This program will provide the groundwork you need to advance your awareness and be involved in the approaching transformation in consciousness. Now, your host, Peter Tung. Hello and welcome to Awakening to Conscious Co-Creation. And I'm your host, Peter Tung. Thank you for joining us today. The intention in these episodes is to give you insights into how the planet is shifting in frequency and vibration to a new level of awareness of awareness and how you can be part of this grand awakening. And I'm quite excited today, not only because it's October the 13th, which was a very significant day in the turning point really for the Knights Templars back in on Friday, October the 13th, 1307, where Friday the 13th comes from. And it's not a coincidence that my guest today, William Henry, has a lot of expertise in that area as well as in many, many other areas of awakening, conscious co-creation. So, William, welcome to the show today. Thank you, Peter. I'm very happy to be here. We've got so much to, to cover today, and I, I want to give everybody a, a, a really good sampling of, of your work. But before we get into specifics, I just wanted to... Uh, segue in from last week's show when James Gilliland from the Aseti Ranch was on and, and he said to me to make sure I asked you to talk about your experiences when you were down at Aseti. So perhaps we could begin there. Oh, I'll be happy to. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, James has been a, a longtime friend. I've uh, met him on the UFO circuit, gosh, probably 10 years ago or so. And every time I'd see him, he'd, he'd invite me as well as all other speakers and researchers up to his uh, his noted ranch up there in southern Washington. And so finally, it was uh, 2008, I believe, was the first time I went there. He has a huge conference every 4th of July. He gets several hundred people up there and puts on a wonderful event. And part of the event is the sky watching, of course, where you're, you're, you put out the intention to call in the, some of the ships that he sees flying above his, his ranch there into Mount Adams. And as I'm sure James told you, there's basically two types of craft that they experience up there. They have the, the metallic technological kind of craft, the, the traditional sort of concept of the flying saucer. And then there's the ones that I'm most interested in, and that is the, the organic or biological beings. James believes that some of the beings that they cite or some of the craft that they cite over his, his property there might in fact be these transformed humans that so many different traditions talk about, humans that have gone up to the next human level and become light beings. And, of course, this is something James and I have talked about for years in relation to the Tibetan belief that humans can transform into light beings, the Hindu belief that some of the stars we see in the sky are perfected royal seers, as they describe it, transformed humans who have taken the ultimate next step and transformed themselves into light beings. So with that said, get up there to James's place. And it was uh, the first couple of nights I, I kind of wimped out and went to sleep early, and I, I really paid for it because the, the first night, as soon as I hit, my head hit the pillow, I heard this these shrieks of joy that's just up, just rapturous, blissful explosion. And you know that everybody had experienced something extraordinary. In fact, what they say happens is that when they gather together, they'll see these light ships and they can easily distinguish them from uh, traditional airplanes or NASA craft or, or what have you, satellites. And when they see these lights start to behave in a certain way, they start chanting, power up, power up, power up. And then what happens is, is these lights just suddenly start pulsing. They power up. 
And what happened to me on my uh, on the third night when I was there, a lot of the crowd had already left. It was Sunday night. A group of us are out there, and here comes this light. Sure enough, it's dancing, it's behaving in the way that uh, is suggestive that we might be dealing with some kind of a otherworldly sort of craft. So we start the chant, power up, power up. Next thing I know, here comes this pulse, Woo, right through my heart chakra. A few seconds go by, another pulse, Woo, right through my heart chakra. Three times I get these, these pulses right through my heart chakra. And I'm just standing there in bliss and thinking, now, to my knowledge, the United States Air Force or NASA does not possess a technology that can make my heart do that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish they did. But hadn't you actually been talking previously about the seraphim in your talk that evening well, as well? That, now, now, that's what happened my first time I had the, the, okay. I felt the pulse. The next time... Uh, which was this past summer, Fourth uh, of July, 2010. I, I go up there now. Now I, you know, I've got some experience, and so I go up there. My my presentation was about. Uh, it was called the journey home, and it's essentially about our present unfolding, awakening consciousness. Our especially our our awareness of the center of the Milky Way galaxy and the alignment of our consciousness with that center. We no longer think of the sun as the center of our of our universe. The, the center of our Milky Way galaxy is a far grander cosmic center, and then there's an even greater one beyond that. So we're starting to orient ourselves towards the center of the galaxy. And what I did is I made a presentation about the various myths and symbols of the Milky Way, suggestive that We've been visited most certainly in the past, and we've been visited by beings that absolutely knew at least as much as we do about the Milky Way. And I believe that they left us signs, symbols, legends describing the center of the Milky Way galaxy in particular is a place that's inhabited by ultra-advanced or highly evolved humanoids who have turned themselves into light beings. And I was aligning this with the Christian tradition that talks about Jesus sitting on the on his throne. And so I asked people to think, well, if we think of the Milky Way as the temple, the holy of holies of the temple would be the center of the galaxy and that's where the throne is located. And Christianity has some very interesting ideas about what happens at the throne of God including uh that it is home to a group of beings, pure beings of pure beings of light and love or beings of pure light and love, called seraphim. They're the highest order of angels. They surround God's throne. And in the Renaissance, it was widely held among the, the, the leading thinkers that humans could, in fact, transform into seraphim. Now, the seraphim, when you see them in art, are always portrayed as orange or red. Uh, they're, they're, the name seraphim means fiery serpent, so they're, they're often shown as fiery red. And I made the, the connection between the seraphim, the definition of the seraphim is fiery serpent, and the Maya tradition, which talks about the return of Quetzalcoatl from the center of the galaxy in 2012. And the connection is, is that Quetzalcoatl's name means the feathered serpent. And so I asked the question, is it possible that the Maya 2012 prophecy surrounding Quetzalcoatl is referring to the appearance in our world of a seraphim or perhaps many seraphim angels, should we begin looking to the skies for sightings of the seraphim angels? Well, after my presentation, James stands up and he says, uh, oh, and by the way, I had, I had proposed that the seraphim could be not only transformed humans who have turned into light beings, but that they travel our galaxy and maybe interdimensionally through stargates and wormholes. So, James gets up after my talk and says, oh, and tonight at 9 o'clock we're going to open up a Stargate. And, of course, I chuckled, just like everybody else in the group, and he says, no, I'm serious. At 9 o'clock we're opening a Stargate. Sure enough, 9 o'clock comes around. Several hundred people gather into the conference hall, and James starts calling in these various ET energies, as he describes them, ascended masters, various the Pleiadians, Andromedans, different different uh, groups, uh, uh, star nations. And we walk out of that event. James and I are standing there with 30 or so people. We look up in the sky, and there's Venus, big and bright, absolutely just stunningly gorgeous. And then, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, appears this 
orange and red ball of light hovering above us about 100 feet. And we go through, or I went through, kind of the traditional pace, paces. It's not a helicopter. It's not making any noise. It can't be a plane. It's way too low. You dismiss that, and all of a sudden you're looking, you're seeing this thing is not only red and orange, but it's pulsing in concentric rings. And it proceeds to fly over us for about 45 seconds. Two people who were standing with us there had uh, the presence of mind to turn their cameras to videotape, and they videotape recordings of it. And while it, it's not decisive what you see in the video, you feel the energy of the people who were just absolutely like, it was like they had just were cheering a football team and their team just won at the very last second on a Hail Mary pass. They are absolutely out of their minds in ecstasy at the appearance of this light that just floated over us. And after that, half the people started saying, that's a seraphim, that was a seraphim. Now, I can't say for sure it was a seraphim, but it sure did fit the description of the way uh, they are portrayed in Judeo-Christian art, and it was very synchronistic with what I had been saying. And one more thing I want to add uh, that caught my eye as well on this is that just a couple of weeks ago, there were a group of seven former Air, Air Force um, nuclear missile uh, guardians who had a press conference in Washington, D.C., and they were telling how um, on different occasions in the 1960s our, some of our nuclear installations were disabled by what they described as UFOs. And when they described the UFOs, in one instance they said it was an orangish, reddish orb that was about 30 feet in diameter that hovered above the, the, the nuclear missile silo. And I wasn't the only one. I had a friend who was actually at that press conference who had seen my presentation.